God's people said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, good morning. It's good to be here from the great state of Texas. Now, I know when I say Texas, all of you are going to be a little bit worried because Texas have this reputation of always talking about Texas. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try not to do that too much because I'm not originally from Texas. I have been there for the last 23 years, which kind of makes me a kind of, you know, implanted Texan. But I'm actually from Louisiana. So, uh, so I kind of feel more kindred spirit with those in Alabama than I do with those in Texas. The, te- the people in Texas keep saying they're Southern. And I keep telling them they're not really Southern. <laughs> but they don't get that. Uh, I feel like Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Georgia, that's South. And you cross, you know, Texas, it's just not Southern. It's a little bit Southern, but it's a little more Western. It's a little more, I don't know, it's just not Southern. And so... Uh, yeah, so, so I'm, you know, I feel like I'm with you in Alabama. I feel like I'm one of you. You're kind of my people, and uh, I, it's nice to be back in the South, in the real South. So this morning I'm going to, and, and I also want you to know how much I appreciate your pastor and Matt and um, for asking me to come in. I'm, I'm not the easiest guy to invite in uh, because a lot of times when I come in, uh, people come out and kind of protest the fact that I'm here or the stuff that I want to talk about because I tend to talk about issues that typically people are uncomfortable about, things like your identity and your sexuality and things like that. And so folks get really uncomfortable. Uh, Some of you are probably already getting a little bit uncomfortable just because I've mentioned those things, so you're wondering where is he going with this and what is he going to say, and I promise you it won't be that bad. But, um, you know, it, it, it can be a little controversial. So the fact that your pastor is brave enough and godly enough to say, you know, hey, this is an important issue for the church. We need to talk about these things. We need to be equipped. Uh, I so appreciate that and appreciate him uh, for inviting me to do that and take it as a great privilege. Well, we're going to look this morning at kind of who we are in Christ and and how we're made. And one of the things that, that that I realize in our world for sure is that our world is in an identity crisis. I mean a big identity crisis. We don't know who we are, where we are, how we are, how we got there, what we're supposed to be, who we're supposed to be. We we just don't seem to know any of that anymore. Things that used to be so simple, like whether a person is a male or a female, has now become an incredibly complicated process of discovery. And I don't believe that's really how God intended for it to be, but I certainly believe that that's where we are in the world that we live in. And, And one of the reasons, I think, that that we're there is because we all like to have labels that sort of identify who we are or how we are. And, and in some ways, that's not a bad thing. I mean, we do it all the time. We put all kind of labels on us. Just like a minute ago, I said, I'm, I'm sort of Texan, but not really. And I'm Southern. That's another label. And, and I'm from Louisiana and I'm Cajun. So that's another label. Um, you know, so, so you start putting all these labels. Some of, some of us are Republicans. Some of us are Democrats. Some of us are uh, you know, progressives, God bless you, and, and um, they're, they're, they're all kinds of different people, you know, different things, um, you know, some of us are Baptist, and there's Catholics, and there's Pentecostals, and then there's Jump a Few Pentecostals, and then there's, you know, Holiness Church, and I mean, there's just all kinds of labels we put on to help people kind of identify who we are and how we are, and those labels typically uh, portray for us some, some meaning that we're trying to communicate to other people. And so we do that all the time. And, and like I said, some of it's not so bad. For instance, you, you might be identified with your family. So I'm a Shalet. Uh, that name's a little weird. In Texas, they call it Shalete, but, but it's not Shalete because, like I said, they're not Southern, so they don't get it. Um, <laughs> but it's just Shalet. It's like Chevette or Corvette or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's a French name. And so my people come from originally down from Nova Scotia into Louisiana. Okay, now there's not a lot of Shalettes. I don't know if we did something bad along the way or something like that, but they're not a lot of us, so if you meet a Shalette, they're probably related to me in some way. They won't claim that, I understand it, but, um, but nonetheless, they're just not a lot of us, but we take on those labels. So, for instance, you might be a Kennedy or a Rockefeller, lucky you, and, um, you know, or, or a Trump, and all those things may mean something very significant to you because of the family name that you have, and that family helps to identify who you are, and and what I see more and more in the world today is not, not so much a family or even these labels, but, but kind of a definition of ourselves based upon our feelings. We seem to be a world that is full of feeling, and we pretty much want to say that our feeling is going to define how we live out our life. Now, I, I'm, I'm a person who is a very feeling-oriented kind of person. I'm, I, I'm not against feeling in any way. But what I want you to hear really clearly this morning 
is that a feeling can only tell you how you are at any given moment. It cannot tell you who you are. Okay? And so when someone says, you know, I feel sad, well, they're just telling you how they are at this given moment. But they are not sad. They just feel sad. Okay? It doesn't mean they're a sad person, you're a terrible person. No, it just means that in this moment they feel sad. Because if, as you're talking to them, they discover they just won the lottery, well, all of a sudden they may be happy and rich. You know? so, so all of a sudden their identity is completely gone, changed from being sad to being happy and rich because their feelings have changed. Feelings are very, very undependable when it comes to defining who you are. We need some objective reality that's beyond and outside of ourselves that allows us to know who we are, something that's immutable, unchangeable, immovable, so that we can anchor to that immovable reality and to know no matter what circumstances are happening around me, I still am who I am. That's got to be the way that we live our lives. Now, the way that we're living right now, that's not the case. Because you can wake up this morning, be biologically a, a boy, and go to school and decide that you really feel like a girl. Or maybe you're not really either boy or girl. You're just a non-binary person. You can be all kinds of things. That's how we're living out our world today. Now, last year I was looking for some material and trying to figure out some things and, and doing some research and looking for some videos, and I came across a video that was just in an unlikely place by an unlikely company. Uh, I totally expect to find, you know, pro-gay or pro-LGBTQIA plus stuff from the <laughs> folks who, um, and those are the letters now, uh, but, but from folks who, you know, kind of push and support that sort of thing. I expect them to have videos about their stuff and what they believe, uh, but I was kind of shocked at this one because this one came from a corporate so source that I thought was rather odd. It came from Levi's. Now, when, when I think of Levi's, I just think of blue jeans. You know, and, and I had to admit this, and I guess a little chauvinistic on my part, but I actually think of Levi's probably in a more masculine way than I do a feminine way. Because to me, when I think of blue jeans, I'm thinking, well, that's what you wear when you go work on your truck, when you're going out in the yard, digging the garden. It's kind of, you know, it, it, it's more of a, it's a go-to-work kind of thing. I mean, I know there's pretty jeans and fancy jeans, and we wear jeans to all kinds of things nowadays. But, but just in my head, I, I guess I'm always thinking, well, that's more of a kind of a masculine thing that is a feminine thing. I, I, didn't, I didn't know and didn't think that Levi's would enter into the fray of defining people's reality. But I was grossly mistaken. Because nowadays, all kinds of corporations are virtue signaling, if you will, to show that they are really progressive and they're really understanding and they're really out there on the edge forming the culture. So I found this video, and as I, as I watched it, I in some ways couldn't believe what I was seeing. So it's going to explain to you in two minutes kind of where I think our culture is a lot better than I could in 20. So give it a look. I dream of a world in which you don't have to come out because nothing is assumed. Being an example of the fact that you can be other than straight and other than cisgender and like not have it be such a big deal. I don't think that young queer people need to be told that they're all right because they know that they're all right. To me, pride is just like existing with integrity. It doesn't matter what your color is or your sexual orientation. None of that really matters. At the end of the day, it just comes down to like your passion and how much you really believe in yourself. The biggest thing is to just live your life for you. Pride to me is like a commemoration of all the pioneers before me and everything that they've done to create a world where I can feel comfortable to be me. I think being young and gay is community. As a teenager, I think coming to realize I was queer, the biggest difficulty that I faced was not seeing myself as an adult. And going to Pride that first year showed me, this is me, this is my home, this is where I belong. When I was growing up, all I did was artistic things. I wanted to paint, I wanted to cook. At that time, I had no one to inspire me to do that until I started doing drag that I realized that I had been living my life as an artist, but I didn't believe in it. I'm very grateful because I know people in the LGBTQ community that were back in the 50s or the 60s or the things, they didn't have the things that I have. It's so necessary for us to be ourselves. In order to have pride, you have to have so much courage. Like, this is who I am, you know, whatever that is for you. 
says, I am love and magic. I am much. A human being? I am fearless. I added a period because it's a complete statement. It's like a full sentence. I am. Now, I hope that wasn't offensive to anybody, but I hope also, as you watched it, that you saw that they were giving lots of images, lots of names, lots of labels to who they are and to how they are and to what they want you to believe about them. But I hope in the midst of it all that you weren't so offended that you couldn't see that first and foremost, every single person that was saying something in that video is in fact a person created in the image of God. They're each a creature of God's creation that are fearfully and wonderfully made. They may not know that they have the potential to be adopted into the kingdom of God, but they absolutely are made in the image of God. And it's so easy for us to look at those images and because of our backgrounds or our beliefs or our ideology to look at them and say, well, I don't want to have anything to do with them and I don't like them and they're bad people or terrible people or uh, you know, people to stay away from my kids and my church and all those sort of things. But the reality is they're just simply people. Now, they may believe differently than you believe. They may do some things that you don't think are correct for them to do, but, but they're just people made in the image of God that need the redemption of God in their life. And those are the kinds of people we meet each and every day. In fact, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but when I have asked people to raise their hands in churches all across America, do you know someone who is identified as gay or something other than heterosexual? It's rare that there's somebody who doesn't know somebody now. It is that prevalent in the world that we live in. And so as we look at that video when we see the proclamations that they make there are several things that stood out to me one says well i think we need to exist with integrity and i thought well that's an interesting phrase for somebody to say especially somebody who is saying at the same time they're walking in integrity that you just need to be whoever you really are well where does integrity come from if there isn't an absolute truth that we all can look at as a standard of what is true and what is integral we have to have that. Well, they didn't seem to have that. They said, well, you just need to live for you. And I thought, well, that sounds nice when you say it quickly, but what does that actually mean? Well, what that means is if, if I'm living for me and you have a house that's nicer than my house, I can just come take your house, and I don't care what you think about it because I'm just living for me. If you have a car that's nicer than my car, I'm going to take you out of your car and grab it because I want that car because I'm just living for me. Well, there's no way that we really want an entire world to live for your own personal satisfaction. That, that would be horribly chaotic, but yet that's what they said. You just need to live for you. That's their definition of love, if you will. And then the one that really got me the most, the one that disturbed me, the one that captured me and, and made me stop and think about this more was the very, very last one that you saw, where I believe it's a young lady who had the white hair and she had on the jacket and she opened it up and she said, I put a period at the end of this because it's a complete statement. I am, period. And I thought, whoa. And I thought to myself, was there nobody in the marketing department, no good Jew or halfway uh, connected Christian who looked at that and, and said about that statement, whoa, wait a minute, I don't really think this is a good thing to put out there in the public because this is actually the name of God. And when I realized that, I thought, wow, that really is the problem in our culture today. The problem in our culture today is that we have now gotten to a place of enlightenment and knowledge that we all believe that we have become our own God, and we don't need God. What is true about all the folks that you saw in that video is that each one is self-defining their own reality, therefore saying to a heavenly father who created them fearfully and wonderfully that ultimately you didn't do such a fearful or wonderful job, and I am now going to recreate myself in my own image. And when I become the arbiter of my own truth, I'm certainly going to make sure that everything I do brings incredible amounts of pleasure and satisfaction to me. There's no reason for me to sacrifice, and therefore, really, there's no reason for me to actually love. Because real love, as we understand it in Scripture, is only that which happens when we're willing to give selflessly of ourselves. It's not about me, it's actually about you. 
Well, that's the world that we live in today. It's a world that wants to define our life by our feelings rather than our faith. It's a world that says that you can place all these labels upon yourself and whatever label sticks to you is the one that you can be that day. It's a world where everything seems to be turned upside down and topsy-turvy. Well, Paul had something to say about that kind of world, believe it or not. And though we think it's uniquely ours today in the 21st century, and in some ways it is, but I want you to know it's not necessarily that different than some of the things that happened even in ancient times. As Ecclesiastes would say, there's very little new under the sun. So if you have your Bibles, turn in it to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 11. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. The city of Corinth was a very, very uh, secular place. It was a hedonistic place. It was a place with lots of altars to gods, uh, lots of shrines to all kinds of deities. There were all kind of hedonistic activities that were taking place within uh, the city of Corinth. And what's, I think, difficult sometimes for we as Christians in the 21st century to understand, especially in Western American Christianity, is that we think that Christianity is like it is here all the time, everywhere. And so when we read about a church, we think, oh, well, it's like our church. You know, we all get together here, we gather, we're all here, it's a bunch of people, everything's good, there's not any problems, nobody's trying to break in and, and, and shoot us or kill us or take us out because of what we believe. We just think that's kind of how church is everywhere. But the reality was that this little church in Corinth was just this little bitty church in Corinth. Like, they probably weren't near as large as the group that's gathered right here. It was a little small group of people that believed in something that nobody else in the world was believing. It was a little bitty group of people who had the entire world's pressure coming upon them on a daily basis because they believed in this crazy idea that God came from heaven, lived a sinless life, went to a cross and died for them and rose again on the third day and is now seated at the right hand of God. They believed that craziness. And everybody else didn't. And so Paul is writing back to that little church that he started, that he knew well, that he was intimate with. He's writing them back and he's saying, hey, listen, I know this world's going to come against you. I know that they're going to put a lot of pressure on you. I know that it's going to be difficult to stand against the current of the culture. But he says, I want you to know God is with you and God can do it. Does that sound familiar? I mean, that's pretty much what's happening right now in the church. And it's a real new reality for the Western church because we've never had to put up with a whole lot of opposition for church stuff. We just did what we did. I can remember a time when you wouldn't have activities on Wednesday night. Why? Because there was church on Wednesday night. And all the Baptists went to church on Wednesday night. We had Wednesday night church. We had prayer meeting. We had supper. We had all kinds of Bible studies and groups for kids and all that kind of stuff. So you didn't have any practices on Wednesday night. You certainly didn't have practices on Sundays. But now that's not the case. Now people have practice whenever you want to have practice. You know, you want to play ball on Sunday, you play ball on Sunday, you play ball on Wednesday. And nine times out of ten, most of the church people choose to go play ball and not come to church. And so, yeah, it's a little different. It's a little different world. But there was a time when it was not like it is now. So Paul says, hey, I know that pressure is coming against you. So Paul, writing to that church that he loves, writes them and he says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, when Paul asked that question, he's not asking that question for an answer. He asked that question rhetorically because he already knows the answer. And the answer that he knows is because he taught them that unholiness and holiness can't exist in the same space. He knew that unrighteousness and God's holiness can't be together. In order for, there to be, uh, in order for you to be in the presence of holiness, you've got to get holy. He also knew that it was nearly impossible, was impossible for you to work your way into holiness, that something had to happen to you, and he'll tell you a little bit what's going to happen to you in order for that to happen. But he says, I want you to know that this unrighteousness cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, so if you are an unrighteous person, you can't get into this kingdom that, that Paul's been preaching about and talking about, this kingdom that this church in Corinth is believing is come in Jesus. And so he says, don't be deceived. Now, I love that. I love that little line. Don't be deceived. And I think, well, that's kind of weird. Why did Paul say don't be deceived? Well, to me, you wouldn't tell someone not to be deceived unless the possibility of deception was present, right? It's kind of like if I told you, be careful when you go out of the parking lot and you make that left, there's going to be a huge hole there on the left. Don't fall in that hole because it'll bust your tire. And then you go out and you make that exit to the left and there's absolutely no hole there. 
Matter of fact, it's all beautifully paved and everything is perfect. And you would come back and say, well, that guy was crazy. Like, what was he talking about? Why did he say that? Well, Paul's only saying don't be deceived because he knew that the culture that was pushing against them was going to seek in every way possible to deceive them, to move them from the truth to something less than the truth. And, and, and let me say this, deception doesn't have to be the embodiment or embracing of massive confusion and, and absolute lies. Matter of fact, that rarely happens. What does happen in deception is we incrementally uh, compromise truth beliefs for something lesser, and over time, we move to a different spot. Rarely does it happen where we just simply are walking in this direction and go, oh, stop, and we're going to go over here. No, what we do is we're walking in this direction and we're headed true north, and what we decide to do is, well, we're just going to move two degrees to the east. And then we start walking. Well, guess what? If you're two degrees to the east and you walk it for 60 miles and you were supposed to be headed north, you're going to end up in a different place than you were intending to go. You see, the devil doesn't have to get us to move off completely of truth. He just got to get you a little bit off kilter to where you're supposed to be going. And next thing you know, you're in a different city, different place, a different reality. Now, this idea of deception is nothing new. We think, oh, well, this is coming up here in this new reality that the first century Christians are living in. But the reality is it goes, Paul goes all the way back, and I'm sure thinking about the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 3, where God had instructed them of how to live in the garden and what to do. And the woman, Eve, is talking to the devil, and the devil said to her, did God really say? Now, what is that doing? Well, that's being deceptive, because what he's doing is he's planning a lie and saying to her, well, God really won't kill you. God, God's really keeping you from knowing all the things that God knows. And if you'll just listen to me, I, I, I promise you this is going to work out better for you. So the devil, the author of lies, the father of lies, is always at work to deceive us, to get us ever so slightly off. The, the, the proclamations I hear from so many young people that say, well, you know, but, but love is love. And I'm like, really? Tell me that when you're married. Because if I said to my wife, oh, I love my iPhone, and I love you, she would not be a happy camper, okay? She doesn't want me to love her in the same way I love my puppy, you know? I mean, love is not love. There's different kinds of love, and there's different kinds of love for different kinds of relationships. So love, no, love isn't love. And the love that God has for us is an unconditional, incredible, amazing, self-sacrificing, self-giving, life-altering kind of love. And he said, that's what I want you to experience. So, so Paul starts off and he says, hey, don't be deceived. And he says, in case you're not sure about what things you might be deceived on, let me just give you a few. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list. I don't think this is all the sins of the people in Corinth. But I think it was probably the more predominant sins that Paul knew that they were dealing with. And it is a vice list, as they call it. Uh, he does this in several places where he writes letters to churches. And he lists a bunch of specific things that are sinful. He says, sexual immorality, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor effeminate men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, period. Bad, bad, bad news. No good news in that statement, y'all. And the reason there's no good news in that statement is because we're all guilty of something in that list. Now, I know you're looking at it thinking, well, I'm not that sexually immoral person. I'm certainly not that homosexual person. My goodness, no, I'm not that. You know? But then when you start looking at it, you realize, well, wait a minute, there's more than that there. It says also people who are idolaters. And you say, well, now, Ricky, I'm not an idolater. That's ridiculous. I would never bow my knee to some idol and worship some. I would never do that. Well, I'd say, okay, I'm kind of wanting to believe you but I don't I think you're mistaken. You see, I, I office in Arlington. My office, our headquarters is in Arlington. And my office building, out of my window, I can see a $1.2 billion worship center that was built uh, to the glory of Cowboys. Yeah, Cowboy Stadium, just right outside the window. Okay, I can see it. And, and the people who come to that worship center on the Sunday or Monday when the Cowboys are playing, uh, they pay $75 a piece to park in the parking lot to then pay $300, $400, $500, $500 plus dollars, hundreds of dollars to sit in the seat to watch grown men in tights chase a pigskin. I mean, just think about that for a moment. 
okay? Now, what would happen if the pastor said, in order for you to come to church, you need to pay $75 to park in the parking lot to come hear the Word of God? I mean, we could pay the building off quick, but, but would you pay $75 every week to come hear the pastor preach? Don't answer that because you'll hurt his feelings, okay? The reality is most of us wouldn't do that. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. We, you know, we shouldn't charge for people to come to church to be able to hear the Word of God freely. Well, okay, maybe so. But the reality is you will pay $75 to park in the parking lot to go see the Cowboy game. You would. And it just kind of shows us where our priorities are. I remember I was in a church one time where somebody got really upset because the, the minister of music, God bless you, brother, um, but the minister of music had played, had introduced a new song, and it was really upbeat, and he had a lot of young people in the service, that particular service, and so, man, the young people were getting with it, and they were swinging back and forth and raising their hands and clapping and jumping up and down in the pew. I mean, they were just, like, in it. They were worshiping. It was awesome. And some of the other folks said, well, I don't know about all that. That's crazy. I can't believe we're doing that kind of stuff in church. That's not worship. And what was so crazy about it is those same people on Friday night were out at a football game acting a fool. You know, they were screaming, they were yelling, they were throwing hot dogs at the, at the field. I mean, they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff, but yet it's okay to get excited about that, but it's not okay to worship God with that same exuberance. Now, something is wrong with that, y'all, and, and we Baptists need to get over the frozen chosen idea and, and, and move on with the reality that, you know, we can just be a little more expressive if we need to be, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So there's probably a little idolatry that happens in our life sometimes. I mean, y'all have this thing, I think, going on here with Alabama and Auburn, I hear. There's some kind of rivalry that happens between those two teams. I don't understand it, except for that my pastor is a huge, huge Auburn fan. He, he bleeds blue and gold or yellow, whatever it is, and um, all the time, all the time. And so being from Louisiana, my wife and I, we were LSU fans, okay, so when Auburn happened to play LSU like they did recently and whooped them like yard dogs, um, you know, we would, we would often, uh, you know, he would find on that, on that Sunday morning just a little tiger up on the pulpit or something like that, just a little reminder that would sort of humble him because he could talk trash pretty bad most of the time. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things. So, yeah, I think we all have a little bit of idolatry that, that probably happens in our life. And then it says there were, there were people who... Um, we're adulterers. Now, I know you're thinking, oh, no, no, okay, see, we're not there. We're not adulterers. We never cheat on our wife or our husband. But the Bible says that even if you look at another person with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery. So pretty much everybody, probably, probably guilty of that, pretty close to it. It says uh, that they're thieves. He said thieves are not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. You said, now, Ricky, we don't steal. We don't ever steal. Like, I'm an honest, honest person. So you've never taken a paper clip or a Post-it note or a pen from the office. Never. Never happened to you. Well, the reality is the Bible doesn't say what the thing is that you're stealing. It just says if you took anything that didn't belong to you, guess what? You're a thief. No heaven for you. Okay? All right? So he says greedy. Well, we're about to have Thanksgiving in America. Can we talk about greed? Um, I promise you, all of you will cook more food than you can consume. You will consume more food than you should. And we will all go into a coma somewhere around 2 o'clock. Okay? But the reality is, I mean, the, the surveys say of America that most Americans are at least 20 pounds overweight. And I think that's being polite. Okay? So the reason we're overweight is why? Because we eat too much. Well, why do we eat too much? Because we're greedy. And food's good. Okay? And if you're from Louisiana, it's even better, all right? So, so, you know, we're greedy. So we're greedy. We're guilty of that. We're not going to have drunkards. Now, here's where the Baptists got it made, right? Because we're not drunk. By golly, we do a lot of things, but we don't drink, at least not in public where people know about it, all right? We just do that with the Methodist on Saturday nights, all right? So he said, revilers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, period. So all of those things are bad things, right? All of those things can keep you out of heaven. All of those things, if you do any of those. But then it also says this thing about homosexuality. Those who practice homosexuality and those who are sexually immoral. The word sexually immoral is actually the word pornea. It's that big, all-encompassing Greek word that would mean any sexual activity that was outside of a man and a woman married together for life, committed to one another. So anything other than that would be pornea. But then he mentioned specifically idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals. And he says, if you have the NIV, it says men who practice homosexuality are effeminate men. It's actually two different Greek words. One is malakoi, the effeminate men. 
Um, Malakoi means a person who is the softer or the more passive of the two partners. Uh, Arsenakoite is the, is the word of the homosexual male. It is the one who is the more initiating partner. And the Malakoi word is probably as close, scholars tell us, is probably as close as we would have to a transsexual in the first century because they were people who often would dress themselves like women and maybe have makeup or longer hair, sort of adorn themselves as a woman to attract the attention of men. They didn't have all the surgeries and chemicals and you know, things that we have today, but, but that's what they did. And Paul says all of that would mean that you're not going to get into the kingdom of God. That's bad, 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 bad news. But look what he also says in verse 11. Here's where the good news comes in. And if there's a verse in your Bible that you want to underline, this might be one of them. He says, and that is what some of you were. Hmm. And such were some of you. Wow. In other words, there were people in the first century church that had heard the gospel, experienced the gospel, and in the process of doing so, had been transformed in such a way that they no longer were what they used to be. So in other words, every one of those things I just read you, the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, they had all been transformed by the power of God. They were no longer living the way they used to live. They weren't acting the way they used to act. They weren't doing what they used to do. Why? Well, because the gospel had impacted them. Look what he says. He says, And such were some of you, but here's what happened to you. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Oh my goodness. You see, Paul knew that they had heard the gospel of Jesus from him, and when you hear the gospel, the gospel transforms your life. It transforms all of your life. Now, it always doesn't do it in an instant. Everything doesn't get perfect. But what it does do is it gives you a completely new way to look at the world, a completely new way to respond to the world, and a completely new way to live in the world that you are not who you used to be. Now, there's lots of you here right now that you're very different than you used to be. Matter of fact, I've always thought one of the great experiments we ought to do in the church is one day where I'm going to stand at the back of a church door and I'm going to have little headbands for everybody that comes in. And I'm going to let you write on the top of the headband, what is your greatest, most dark, most secret sin? And I want you to put it on there, and then I want you to wear it on your headband, and I want you to come to church. And I want everybody to have their sin right on their forehead. And I bet you you won't want to sit with all the people you're sitting with. Like, there's some scary folks that live in the church, okay? They've done some pretty wicked things, but the power of the gospel has transformed them, all right? And so when that power comes upon you and it transforms you, it changes who you are. And that's exactly what happened to to Paul's folks there in Corinth. They had been transformed. And I'm convinced that if God is the God we believe in the Bible who says that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, if God can do that kind of transformation in the first century, can God not do that same transformation in the 21st century? Now that doesn't mean that you're never going to be tempted by that sin again. It doesn't say that. What it says is you were changed. Now, change doesn't mean that you don't ever have a temptation to an old habit. You may, but now you have the power because of the Holy Spirit living in you to not succumb to that temptation and to move in a different direction. God empowers us to do. That's what grace actually is, y'all. It's not just this unmerited favor to where we get forgiven of our sin. Yes, it is that, but it's more than that. It's that, but it's also power. Grace is power to resist the bad things that we're trying and wanting and desiring to do and to be transformed into the kingdom of light where we can live in a way that's very different. That's the beauty of God's gospel. We said, well, how did that happen? He says, well, you were sanctified. What does sanctification mean? Well, sanctification means that you've been set apart and made holy. Now, it doesn't mean you are holy, but you've been made holy. You say, well, Ricky, how can you, that that just sounds crazy. Well, it does kind of sound crazy. I'll agree. I don't feel like when, when, when I'm talking to God, I don't feel like I'm a holy person, but the truth of scripture says that I'm holy because he says I'm holy. He has sanctified me because of the work of Jesus on the cross. Okay, I am sanctified. I am being made more holy every day. And, and what I've learned through the years is that the longer I stay with Jesus and the longer I walk with Jesus and the more sp- time I spend in the Word, that the Word of God continues to wash over me, to cleanse me, and to make me whole. That's a good news. That's really good news that God is separating me. And the first thing he says is that we're washed. Well, everybody knows what washed is. That's not even a big word. I mean, we can figure that out, right? We all washed before we came to church today. Most of us did. Some of you haven't, and the people next to you know. 
all right? But typically you wash. Now, washing's kind of a, 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 an interesting thing because washing says that we're dirty to begin with, right? You don't wash if you're not dirty, okay? So when we wash, it says that we've got something dirty. Well, we've got all this sin that's clinging to us, and we need to get washed. Well, how do you get washed in Scripture? Well, the Bible tells us we just come into the path of grace. And so it's like this big waterfall of grace that's coming down from God to us, and all we have to do to get clean is to stand in the flow of that grace. So here's this waterfall of grace coming down upon us. It's washing over our sins, and it's washing us clean. And in the process, God says, well, not only are you washed, but you're sanctified. And then not only are you sanctified, but you're justified. Justified is a, is a legal term uh, from a court system that basically says that you are, in fact, guilty, but I'm going to declare you to be something that you're not. I'm going to declare you to be good when, in fact, you're not good. I'm going to make you right by the declaration, and I, because I'm the judge and have the power, I can make that declaration. So sure enough, what does he do? God says, those of us who are in Christ, we're new creatures. We're not like we used to be. He's declared us a new creature. Now, do we always feel like a new creature? No. You know, when I woke up this morning in a new bed and a new place, getting ready to go to church, there's times in the morning where I'm thinking, now, Lord, is this really what you called me to do? And this is what I'm supposed to do today. You know, I know you don't think preachers ever think that, but they actually do think that pretty often. Matter of fact, most times on Sunday morning, because <laughs> they know they got to go to church and meet every one of you. <laughs> and you're feeling that way too. And you're thinking, why are we here at the church? We could be doing something else. And not all of you. I know some of you love coming here. Um, but, you know, it, it's just the reality of being human. Sometimes we wonder, why? Why are we doing this? What's going on? This is so crazy. But he says, yep. He says, I'm going to justify you. And he's doing all this how? Look, look how he does it. He says, I've done this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. What in that statement has anything to do with you? Nothing. That's why I like it. Because if it depends on me, I'll mess it up. But if it depends on God, it's dependable. Right? And so sure enough, what God says there is that he has made this happen because of Jesus. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of our Lord and Savior, and by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God moved in a way in our hearts that allowed us to be transformed, changed, renewed, justified, sanctified, redeemed. All of that happened in us, to us, because of Jesus, not because of us. It reminds me of a, a story of a young man that I know, um, raised by two really young parents, uh, they got married really early, and so the dad had to go out of town a lot and work. And, and so the little boy was there with his mom. He was a sensitive little boy and, and very gifted little boy. And so, uh, you know, his mom loved him. She was a stay-at-home mom, but his dad wasn't home. His mom had two sisters, but they weren't married. He had two grandmothers, but they also were unmarried and divorced. And so this little boy grew up with a bunch of ladies, and they loved him, and they invested in him. And he went on to school, and he did really well. He went through middle school and high school and, and got into high school and made great grades and became a part of the National Honor Society and student council president in his senior year. I mean, everything was just going swimmingly for this guy. And everybody thought, wow, you're great. He even, he even was doing so well that in his senior year, they asked him, they said, hey, you're graduating near the top of your class. Why don't you give the commencement address at your graduation? And he said, sure, I'll do that. So he got up there and he gave a commencement address, got behind the the podium and he gave this rousing address and all the people clapped and the moms elbowed their husbands and said now that girl you know we need to get our daughter to get with this guy he's going places everything on the outside looked wonderful except for he wasn't raised in a christian home and what the people didn't know is inside things weren't wonderful at all in fact they were pretty awful see what they didn't know about this little boy was what when he was four or five six years old one of his grandmothers married for the third time and when she married uh, this granddad came into this little boy's life and, and boy that granddad just loved that little boy and that little boy clung to that grandpa he thought this was the greatest thing he had this male in his life it was exciting his grandpa did all this really cool stuff with him and he thought this is the greatest ever but what they didn't know about that grandpa is that he was a pedophile and he began to molest that little boy from the time he was five or six years old and mom and dad were super protective they didn't they didn't want their little boy to to have any kind of bad experience so they never let any sitters come to their house but they would always take the little boy to his grandma and grandpa's house where grandpa would have his way with the little boy and it became such a normal thing that the boy just thought that's what you do with grandpas he thought it was normal so here he is getting ready to graduate and graduates from from his high school and uh he's realizing that he now has a lot of attractions to some of the guys that are in his school 
And he knows now that these feelings that he have, they're really homosexual feelings, and that if he feels this way, he must be gay. But there was something internally within him that said, I don't really want to be gay, uh, but I do feel gay. And so he thought, what can I do? How can I make this go away? Well, the little bit of religion he knew about, the little uh, sort of Americanized understanding of religion is that, that if you pray, God listens and God moves. And so he thought, well, that's what I'll do. I'll pray and I'll just pray that the gay will go away. And so he prayed and prayed and prayed, but the gay didn't go away. And so finally he decided, well, if the gay doesn't go away, maybe, maybe I need to go away. So early one morning he got up and he went into his mom's medicine cabinet. He grabbed every pill he could find, put it in a big styrofoam cup, chugged all the pills down, went to his room, locked the door, got in his bed and thought he'll never wake up again. Luckily for him, late that night, his mom figured out what was going on as he hadn't been out of the room. And she realized what had happened and he didn't die in that moment. Now, his family never asked him what happened. They never asked why he did what he did. He was a miracle that he had survived, the doctor said. But, but nonetheless, nobody asked anything about it. So it just was like it never happened. Nobody mentioned anything. Six weeks later, he was still depressed. He still had this terribly dysfunctional family. He was still upset and now even felt more like a failure because he couldn't even successfully kill himself. So this time he decided, well, I need to do this better. I need to be more efficient, effective. So he went into his dad's gun cabinet. He grabbed one of the pistols that, his, that he had shot with his father many times before. He grabbed that pistol, loaded it up, went to his room late that evening, went inside, locked the door, got down on the side of his bed and put the gun in his mouth. Just about the time he was going to pull the trigger, he remembered that he had only been to church a couple of times with a friend of his that was in some advanced classes that he had. And his friend said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this piano recital. I'd like you to come and sing. He said, will you do that? He said, sure, I'll do that. And he said, um, well, we need to practice. And in order to practice, you've got to come to church and then we'll practice afterwards. You know how you evangelicals do. Sneaky, 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 okay? So he went, and when he went, he heard the pastor talk about Jesus and how Jesus could change your life, and he would transform your heart and make things new. And he thought in that moment, well, that was the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like, the, the, these Christian people, they really believe this, this old book. They must be weak-minded people. But he remembered that this family was very different than his family. They lived differently. They loved differently. They treated him differently. And he thought, well, maybe, just maybe, what they were saying was actually true. So in that moment, he pulled that steel out of his mouth and he said out loud into the darkness of that night, God, I don't know if you're true. I don't know if you're real. I don't know if you can do what they say you can do. But if you can, you need to do it right now because if you don't, I'm going to pull this trigger and paint that wall red. And in that moment, Jesus showed up to that little boy on the side of that bed and put his arms around that little boy and hugged that little boy. And he said into that little boy's heart, not out loud, but he communicated to that little boy two things. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you, and I will be a father to the fatherless. Now, I know that that is a true story because that's my story. And I never thought in a million years that God would have me going around the world telling people that such were some of you. I, 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 I never imagined that at 26, that I would meet this incredibly beautiful five foot eleven, red-haired, green-eyed woman who, when I saw her for the first time, my heart leapt for joy. And every time I still see her, I think she's the most beautiful woman in the room. Um, I never imagined that we would have 30 years of incredible marriage together. I also couldn't have imagined that just this past April, seven months ago, I would be standing by her bedside at the end of what was a seven-year-long struggle with terminal kidney cancer, and I would be there when she would raise her hand up to the Lord and take her last breath and be gone. And once again, I would hear my father say to me, I promised you that I will never leave you or forsake you. You see, I am the person that Paul talks about in verse 11 where he says, that is what some of you were, but I've been washed. I've been sanctified. I've been justified. I have been remade in the image of my Father. You see, if I had to say what I am, I would tell you that I am Ricky Shillette, a son of God, a child of the King. I am His. And the question for all of you is, are you? 
The problem you may be struggling with this morning is probably not same-sex attraction, homosexuality, not even gender identity confusion. But I promise you there may be a sin in your life that is so big that it's been occupying your heart and it's a constant fight for you. I'm here to tell you it's not that your sin is too big, it's that your concept of God is too small. God wants to take whatever that is because he is a good father. And when good fathers see their kids doing something they shouldn't do and they say, hey, give me that, give me that, and you take it from them, they don't beat you in the head with it and they don't berate you because you gave it to them. They gladly take the bad thing and they put their arm around you and say, we're not going to do that anymore because I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to give you this love. I'm going to give you this connection. I'm going to give you this affection that you need. God is offering us that opportunity this morning. And I hope you'll be open enough to him to say, you know what, God, I need a change. And I all know the only way that that change can happen is if I let you be Lord of my life, King of kings, Lord of lords. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time this morning. I ask that you would move powerfully in those hearts this morning that need transformation. Each and every one of us that are stuck in our sin and need you to come and bring deliverance in a big way. Uh, I know that you're a God of transformation, of change. We see that in the life of Paul, who went from a one who persecuted church to the biggest evangelical church starter that we've ever had. God, thank you for that kind of miraculous change that happens when we trust in you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.